like doing in a hybrid room is like an art form. Like <laughs> you can be like a conductor at an orchestra if you can do this right. Right. Um, oh hell, if no one's going to be here in the room, I can, just, I can just kick this off. Somebody's there, David. What's up, David? Hey, Ed, how's it going? Doing well. Um, give me a second here. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we'll go ahead and start. I mean, people will show up if they show up, whatever. Uh, so, uh, you know what, one, give me one second, let me just send this text to one person really quick. They're coming in. Okay, so let me stop sharing that. All right, here we go. Hey, Hope, good to see you, or see your face. David, good to see you again. Um, it's funny, we're missing out the usual crew. Uh, so uh, for, for Tracy, who wasn't here for the first couple of weeks, so uh, you know the, the, the goal of this group is to, we're gonna be talking about net worth, how to grow your net worth, uh, anything in that, in that realm is kind of fair game for this class. We're going to kind of start by working our way through the MREI book, this book. Uh, oh, that one. Okay. And by, uh, and by the way, if, if you don't have a copy of it, if anybody needs a copy of this book in my office, I literally have like 20 blank copies. Yeah, there you go. Um, Okay, so just to kind of catch everybody up to speed. So there's, there's really gonna be about four, res four sources that I know of so far that we're gonna use for this class for uh, resources, I guess you call them. Uh, one is this book. Uh, and I promise this is that for those of you guys who've been coming regularly, this is the last time I'll cover, <laughs> I'll cover this stuff. Uh, Cause I, I feel like we're not pushing ahead. We just keep covering a lot of stuff. Uh, we're gonna use this book mostly, at least for now. And we are going to be starting to, we're going to start analyzing investment properties. So just know if that's, if that's what drew you to this class, there's going to be a lot of that. It's going to take us a little bit to get there because that's the way they do it in this book. And I like how they do it in this book. Uh, they kind of attack, attack it from a, a, a more global personal finance view. And then they jump into how to invest in real estate. But before they get there, they're talking about you know, what is net, what is work, uh, being wealthy? What, are, you know, all those kind of uh, uh, concepts. We're going to use this book a lot, especially for at first, we're going to work our way through there. There's also a podcast from Ben Kinney. For those of you guys who know Ben Kinney, he's the number one agent in all of Keller Williams, I think. I, I don't know if any more, but he was up until just recently. Uh, and he has a podcast called Win, Win, Make, Give. Win, Make, Give. There's also a website that corresponds to it. We're gonna work our way through that podcast probably after the book. We may jump back and forth. Uh, in fact, we're already, as you guys know, we're, if you were here last week, we're using some of the resources from that book, uh, from that website. Uh, also in addition, uh, there's the podcast, Think Like a CEO by Gary Keller, which season five is kind of like a, uh, audiobook version of this book eh, to some degree, not, not nearly as detailed, but, uh, uh, and that's what we're going to listen to some today. And then uh, what was the other thing that I, that I wanted to, to utilize as well that we had talked about? Um, oh, there's a book called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. Interestingly enough, it's kind of going, uh, a lot of people are talking about it right now. It's kind of, uh, a lot of Keller Williams are talking, people are talking about it because Gary 
interviews him in season five of Think Like a CEO. And uh, if you have a MAPS coach, they've probably mentioned that book to you because it's kind of working its way around the Keller Williams world as uh, books sometimes have a way of doing. Uh, so those are kind of like the four resources. As we go through, by the way, uh, a latest development is that I'm just like, well, as we start accumulating resources, uh, I'm going to either put it on a Dropbox or maybe a, a, we'll create a Facebook page for this little in blossoming investor group. And, uh, and we'll start posting stuff on there as well. So if you want, uh, if you don't already have my contact information, shoot me uh, an email or text message. Okay, there's my stuff. There's my digits. Uh, shoot me an email or text and I'd be happy to include you on, I'll probably, would you anybody pre care, prefer Facebook group versus uh, a shared Dropbox? Actually, let's do a Facebook group because there's, should this group continue and develop and whatever, it'd be easy to work through it using a Facebook group. Okay, so that's there. <laughs> There's a rhetorical question. Would you guys like a Facebook group? Yes, you will get a Facebook group. There you go. Um, okay, so there, there we go. There, there's our start. Uh, okay, so the, in week one, we kind of, I shared a little bit of uh, personal finance about my history, my story. Uh, I invited you guys to do the same. Um, and we also talked a little bit about some key concepts from the first handful of pages from here. Uh, we're talking about what is wealth, right? Uh, what does it mean to be wealthy? And if you ask Gary and Jay, uh, I love their, which by the way, comes very, it, uh, it's very much aligned. Uh, if, if you know the Kiyosaki book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, who also has the, the board game. Um, how was the name of the? Cash flow. Yes, thank you, cash flow. Cash flow, the, the game. Which, by the way, uh, my my brother-in-law gave uh, the kid version to my son, and so we were playing it together. And I was like, "Damn, like I wish someone had played that with me when I was ten years old or nine years old." Um, anyways, okay. So now now that we've got everybody all caught up, uh, the homework for tonight for today was to calculate your net worth, or at least take a first stab at it. What we what we want to do is we're going to start doing this monthly. And of course, if you haven't done this for a while, it's kind of like going to the gym. The first, the first time is going to be very painful. It's, you're going to be sore afterwards. You're not going to be able to walk. That, that's the way it feels when you do your net worth and if you haven't done it in a while. Um, so win, make, give. Uh, again, I'm going to, so shoot me an email and I'm going to create this on a Facebook page. Uh, I'll, I'll share these, but here, I'll, while we're here, win, make, give. Here's the win, make, give uh, website that corresponds to the uh, podcast. And if you go here under resources, it says download resources. Um, okay, I thought I already logged in. Once you do that, there's all these resources to download. There's a net worth tracker here. That's, that's, what we're, that's what we're starting off with right now. There's a basic version and an advanced version, and it's, it's more dependent on how complicated are your finances. Uh, I'm guessing most of you guys are gonna need the advanced one is probably my guess. Uh, and they also have a Google Sheet version or an Excel version. So pick your poison, whatever it is. So that was the homework for today was to do that as well as uh, read the eight myth understandings from this book, which is, it's like, it was like 20 pages long. The pages in this book, uh, they, they move really fast because they're spaced out. So the myth understanding. So on that note, let me open it up to you guys. I've been talking a whole lot. Did anybody do, was I the only one? And by the way, I almost didn't do it, but I, I got it done. Surprisingly, I got done. I, I took a crack at my net worth and my wife and I did it together, which was even more surprising. Uh, was I, did anybody else join me in this, in this venture? I took a crack at it. Hey, right on. I, you guys are far exceeding my expectations for this class. So I'm, I'm super happy about that. And Camille, you did it as well. Oh, you're on mute. 
Unmute, unmute. Yes, I I did um, I did it right away when we got off, and then I got kind of stuck on a few of the numbers, which I was literally finishing up right before this class, as I was watching my net worth decline as I was putting in all the other stuff. So it sounded all you know they start with good stuff and then they hit you with the negative stuff on the bottom. Yeah. So yeah, it's illuminating. Uh, anybody else want to share or, or if, you know, if any of you guys already have, some of you guys may use Quicken and you may already have your net worth just automatic. It, it shows up like if you use Quicken, like, I don't know about your version of Quicken, but the Mac version, like on the left side, if you have everything in there, like the minute you open it up every single time, it shows you your net worth on the, on the left-hand side. It's, it's really the addition and subtraction of all of your assets and accounts on the left side. Um, if you have it in there, uh, anybody else, Eric Bailey, any, any, any ahas, lessons learned? Was it a good feeling? Was it a bad feeling? Was it kind of somewhere in between? It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I mean, it's still depressing, but <laughs> not as bad as I thought. Hey, I've been doing. I've, go ahead, I've been doing it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, go. Uh, all you. I've, I've been doing that for some time, um, and I'm glad that you said Ed that you had some mistakes in the past because. Um, I probably lost six, seven figures um, by doing risky ventures that didn't work out as good as I thought. So it's so I'm back. I'm I'm on it, and it's painful, but I'm letting that go because we're uh, we're on a new journey. <laughs> you know, start where you are. There's a mm -hmm. there's a, a famous book by Pima Chodron, I think her her name, uh, like a, a Buddhist a spiritual person. She's like, you know. Don't worry about the hilltop. Just start where you are right now and start start walking. That's that's how the you know, journey kill, begins. I listen to a lot of bio, biographies or read a lot of biographies, and it's amazing how this is actually more of a standard experience for people who are trying to do stuff. <laughs> like a lot of the people that are super successful have had to start again, uh, and sometimes more than once. It's pretty shocking. Uh, Thank you, David. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing your experience. Anybody else want to sh share their experience too? And I'll, I'll share a little bit too as well. What, while you guys are thinking of who else wants to speak if, at all, I will tell you that first of all, I've been, I've been dragging my feet on putting this class together, even though I know I've been wanting to do it for about three years now. And, and again, it's not really a class. It's going to be a study group and whoever wants to can join me as it becomes a, an investor group over time. You can join me on that journey. You can hang out for as long as you want. That's the journey I'm on and that's where I'm heading towards. And I invite you to join me for as long as you want. Um, and honestly, honestly, I'm prepared to teach this class, even if it's just me by myself and I'll just keep, I'll just, I'm, I'm, I'm committed to it. And I'll tell you, part of why I say that is for myself, by the way. Part of why I've been dragging my feet is because I used to have a lot of money and I don't, and I'm in debt uh, still much, much better off than I was. And, I, and I'm happy to say that none of my debt is high interest like it used to be. Like all of my debt now is kind of pretty much zero to 5% interest, uh, but I have a lot of it still. And uh, you know, there's part of me that's been telling myself, you know what, once I get back to like in the, in the black, then I'll start worrying about this. And I'm like, you know what, if I, I think, I think I'm better off just starting to put this class and this group together. And even if it means I'm the caboose, you know, dragging behind everybody, so be it. I'll learn a lot as I go and I'll figure it out as I go. And by the way, uh, if, you, if you did the reading of the eight myth understandings, it, it was actually, cause I've had this experience where I like, I just, like, I didn't even want to do the net worth thing. I was like, shit, I know I'm in the red. Like, do I really need to know? And, but it was a good experience and it was, humbling and and you know sobering <laughs> you know my wife and I were like you know gulp you know there there it is sure enough but we've made a hell of a lot of progress over the last 24 months 36 months and um like I mean a, fucking, a ton of progress and uh and and it feels good to be in reality and not in denial and and that's how this is going to work is by starting working on the path and one thing that was very comforting to me that we're going to talk about here in a minute was Gary Keller in the eight myth understandings talking about it. If you, you know, we talk about, you need, you need capital, you need time and, and knowledge. 
And if you don't have capital, you can build up the time and the knowledge and you can find the capital to, to you know, you don't, you don't need a ton of money in your pocket to start investing. So that was, I found that comforting. Uh, any other ahas from the, re, from the, from the reading? Don't, don't say too much because we're going we're gonna to spend some time on the eight myth understandings today because uh, uh, in the podcast, Gary, Gary and Jake go through it. And I, I was going to skip it because I know we, we read it, but the, they don't, even though the eight myth understandings are the same, in the book, they describe it one way. And in the podcast, it's like a whole different, it's, they just, they're just talking about it for a while and these whole different examples and everything come up. So it's worth going over again. So, and I suspect some of you guys probably didn't even read it. So uh, I think we'll be good there. Any ahas, uh, but still back to, back to the uh, net worth calculator. Uh, any, any more ahas experiences from doing it? David A. Hope, uh, Miguel, I think, anybody? Yeah, I think there's power and clarity because yeah. it's it's the secret. I'm afraid to look at it stuff that's actually toxic. Yeah, so agree. I so agree. Okay, so here's the here's the plan for the next couple of weeks. We're going to be on the eight myth understandings today. I know it may seem like, oh, you know, do I really need to listen through this stuff? Um, but I found it to be, you know, I, I'm I keep in my head. I'm thinking. When do we get to the good stuff where we start analyzing investment properties? And, you know, like most of Gary's stuff, he starts with your mindset. And I got to say, spending these last couple of weeks talking about it and kind of revisiting mindset around personal finance and wealth building has been wonderful for me. And I hope you kind of feel the same way. Uh, any last comments before I, before I open up and, uh, and jump into the, the podcast? And I got a quick comment. Yeah, go ahead, Miguel. Um, I just want to say it was uh, it was real eye opening, and, and even though mine was in the negative, uh, like way further into the negative than uh, I ever wanted to be, it's still good in that um, I can see that negative getting closer and closer to zero, and, and I can see, I can see the needle moving. Yeah. It's not you know it, the, into the black so much as just as long as I'm consistently moving in the right direction. And that's what, it, you know, the value is, aside from depressing and, and feeling like I hit the gym for the first time. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Ed, uh, I'm going to make a comment here. I think uh, I heard all of you and I wanted to share my uh, experience. Uh, it seems like, uh, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm not in red, I'm wearing black, but uh, uh, I, I experienced this years ago about being in red, and I found out that what I was doing myself was as soon as I had some increase in income, I was using the same velocity of increasing of income and I applied it to, this, uh, to my expenses. Yeah. That's where the mistake was because you need to make sure that you're not spending as fast as you are earning. Yeah, that that's a that's the only way that you can get ahead. If you keep spending this at the same velocity, it's not going. You're not going to get any. You're still going to be in red years ago. I mean, years from now. So that's 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 my experience. That's what I can share with you. That that is a that is a. a a great point, David. And we're, we're going to, Gary is going to talk a lot more about that in the, in the following chapter that we're going to, we're going to uh, tackle next week. A lot of it's going to be around just that of like how, you know, just that, just that. Um, cool. And so with that, if, if there's no other comments, uh, let's, I'm going to open up my podcast here that I've got, hold on, give me one second here. Let me find it. Where'd I put it? Okay. So how do I get that? Well, I guess I can just I can just share my screen and and feel free to talk over this and you know I know unfortunately it's a podcast so it's just audio so we're gonna just be listening here for a little bit but we'll pause it here and 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 comment on it from time to time and if you want to just jump in and I'll pause it so uh, feel free to comment as we go so let me share my screen. Can you guys hear that? Welcome to Think Like a CEO, where we discuss business life and leadership lessons with Gary Keller, co-founder of Keller Williams Realty and executive chairman of KWX. I'm your host, Jay Papasan. 
And on today's episode, we'll discuss the myths that might be holding you back from building your wealth. By the way, you can read if you have your MRI. Book. All right, here we are again, Gary, episode two. Um, in the first one, we did lay down some rules about financial wealth. If you have your book, you can read along and highlight as you go and kind of, yeah, there you go. And it requires passive income and people have to get past a few hurdles, some mental hurdles to get to the idea of what you have to do to earn passive income. Yeah, that's right. The, the, well, here's the way I think about it, Jay. And that is, you, if you're going to be successful in your experiences, you have to learn to wisely invest your time. And if you're going to want to be successful with your money, you're going to have to learn to invest it. So, mm-hmm. and, and by the way, the title that we call that investing is you're an investor. So what we want, yes. So what we want to cover in in this episode is we want to talk about how do you how do you think like an investor? What are the misunderstandings right of, around investing money? And here's the way I think about it. The, it and that is an investor wakes up in the morning and is holding a dollar. A normal person, not an investor, is holding a dollar. That person who's holding a dollar and is not an investor, says, I have a dollar to spend. Right. An investor who's holding that dollar says, I've got 50 cents to spend. I've got 60 cents, but I've got 50 cents or 40 cents to invest. And that fundamentally separates the people that move towards having an abundant amount of money for their life goals and people that don't. So we want you to be an investor. We want you to think when you wake up in the morning, I have a dollar and I'm going to spend X and I'm going to invest X. So here we go. So the way I think about it is uh, fundamentally, there are eight myth understandings between you and financial wealth. And you and I have divided that thinking into personal myths and investing myths. Mm -hmm. So there are three personal myths, right? The first one is, well, Jay, I don't need to be an investor. My job will take care of my financial wealth. And what's the truth about that? Uh, you're, to be an investor, right? You, your job is not your financial wealth. You have to be an investor to get there. And it's that idea of passive versus active income that launched this whole episode. Without passive income, you can't ever achieve financial wealth. Yeah, so even if you have a job uh, that pays you money, you, when you quit working they're going to quit paying you. So whenever you think of your freedom date or your retirement date, if you will, at that moment, you will have had to have invested your money so that it now works for you, right? It's I work for money and my money works for me. When I work for money, it's a job. When my money works for me, I'm an investor. So I'm I'm going to have to become an investor. Now, a lot of people go, no, nah, I don't need to be an investor. I'm just going to go uh, have a job where they set aside money for me. Uh, my parents had teacher's retirement. Right. And that was and that was their that was their view of it. That was their investing. When they got to the date when they wanted to be free, that was all the money they had. They had spent no time in enhancing that in any successful way. And as a result of that, it put a real limit on them and they ended up coming to their kids to help them out financially. We were happy to do it. But I saw that box that they put themselves in because they never thought about being an investor. They always thought about themselves as being a worker. If you had like even a 401k, and for a lot of people, they might be setting aside 4 or 5%, maybe even getting a match from their employer. So in that sense, they, they get a dollar and maybe 5 or 10% is going into investing. And that might take care of your minimums. But you're not being the kind of investor that knows the number they're trying to work backwards from. Like you talked about your freedom number and knows that they're going to get it. And I do think that one of the fundamental differences about being an investor, is you kind of have a target, right? That you're working backwards. That's why when you give the example, you said 40%, 50% of that dollar is going into investing because that advanced payment and then the time and the investment, is that's how you get there. And it's really, it's it's more than you need. That's how you get to the wealth and abundance. Well, I... Just, I want to pause really quick here to remind you guys. So when he's talking about freedom number... You guys all know what we're talking about, right? And, and we've kind of covered this the last couple of weeks, but just to just to recap for all of our sakes. So uh, in Gary and Jay's definition, being wealthy means having enough money 
that you no longer need to work to pay your bills. You work because you like to work and you work because you like your job and you work because you love what you do, but you have enough money coming in from passive income that if you needed to, you could just cruise and not ever have to actively work again and just live off of that and have have enough to make it. That, that number, when you hit enough that you could live off of that, that's what they're referring to as your, as your freedom number, right? So I love that. And I, I've not calculated that for, for me, for Rebecca and I together. I, that, that's something I'm, I'm going to try to do before the end of the month. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. Maybe we'll make that a, 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 a homework a thing that we all try to do. But I just wanted to kind of clarify that before, before we move on here. I, I was blessed. My degree is in real estate. I studied real estate. Real estate is one of the places you can put, you can invest money and get a return on it. Mm -hmm. And when we were building our company, uh, I didn't have any excess money. I got paid a salary, Jay. And it was, it, that salary was way below what I had been earning as the vice president expansion for the company I had worked for. I took an, an immense pay cut for years. And Mary and I wanted to, you know, we needed to pay our house off. Uh, we we wanted to do some things and th the company wasn't going to pay me. I was going to mm -hmm. keep that money right there. So I had to go invest. And I still, Mary still remembers it, uh, us driving down uh, one of the main streets in our town called Bee Cave Road. And we were just looking for real estate to invest. And uh, we had to stop because Mary had to throw up because she was having sickness from pregnancy. Mm -hmm. But we found a property. We bought that property and I think we paid like $360,000 for that property. And a little over a year later, we sold that property for $1.1 million, mm. literally a little over a year later. And by the way, how do you think I paid cash for the second home? There you go. Yeah. And then, and then a handful of years later, we needed, we, we needed money again. And I, I, I went and invested in a stock and um, put in $50,000 into that investment and came out with uh, approximately three quarters of a million dollars uh, less than a year later and sold immediately because I couldn't repeat it. I, I didn't know how to repeat it and took that money and again, uh, finished paying off house, paid off, yeah, and all of that. And and it was all about, again, staying free. But that had nothing to do with Keller Williams. So you said something there. I just want to go back. I've seen you teach high school kids about money, right? You've got you know, like teaching financial literacy to teenagers, right? Young college. And you'll like hold up a, a tennis shoe. Here's a high top. How much is this worth? And and almost every hand goes up and they can get within 5 or 10%. That's a $120 sneaker. That's right. One of the lessons I got to witness you kind of teaching them because like the difference between someone who's wealthy and someone who's not, the investor mindset is almost everybody knows the value of stuff that you spend your money on, right? This sneaker is probably not going to go up in value. The investor learns how to value things that do go up in value that are actually assets and investments. So you'd studied real estate. You'd been in real estate. When you saw that lot, you knew that it was an investment opportunity. And that's just a choice journey. Like, are you willing to learn the value of those things so that you can be that's an right. investor? Yeah, that what I do with kids is I say, I, I actually always ask a girl to hand me one of her shoes uh, be, because at that age, they know the value of a shoe. And I hold the shoe up and I say, let me ask you a question. If I offered this shoe for a dollar, assuming that you all liked this shoe, um, is that a good deal or a bad deal? And I need your answer. Raise your hand if you think it's a good deal. Everybody raises their hand. I said, oh. so you understand that, that, that that's cheap. Okay, so if I offered it to you for 50 bucks, is that a good deal or a bad deal? Raise your hand if it's a good deal. Everybody raises their hand. I said, okay, so now I offer you the shoe for $500. Raise your hand if you think that's a good deal. Nobody raises their hand. And I go, okay, so you've mastered the understanding of the value of a shoe. They go, yeah. And then I'll go pick up a pen and I'll say, I offer this pen to you for 10 cents. You think that's a good deal or a bad deal? Raise your hand, it's a good deal. They all raise their hand, it's a good deal. I say, okay, cool. I offer you this pen for $5, is that a good deal? Raise your hand, nobody raised their hand. I said, okay, 
So broadly, you understand the value of this pen where it's a good deal or a bad deal, right? They say, yeah. I said, the problem is you kids have mastered BS. Mm. You've mastered the value of BS. You've mastered the value of consumables. And you're brilliant at spending your money on consumables because that's what you look at all the time. You study it, you like it. So you know whether it's glasses or a shirt or a meal or right whatever, you know the value of it and you're not going to overpay, yes or no. And they go, no, I'm not going to overpay. Awesome. The only difference between you and an investor is they've mastered the value of things that appreciate or generate income. Mm-hmm. That's the only difference. And, and not all look, of them. It's not like they, like most investors only learn a very narrow wedge of right. those things that do that. You don't have to learn about everything. Yeah. No. Well, again, the point is, is that that's the difference, right? Now, I cringe a little bit when you use sneaker because actually, depending upon whether they're a Nike. Oh, uh, we do know or, a collector of expensive sneakers. So, correction, I, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, here's the point, though. The point is, is that you could actually make money on consumables as well if you under if you understood value, right? You, but the problem is, it would have to be an extraordinary consumable that would actually appreciate because ninety nine point nine percent, unless they've turned into a collector item thing, uh, it, they're not right. The um, a good a good example, you know, I've talked about this is when I understood what investing was, Jay. And I knew that that I needed to become an investor. I began to look at everything as as is, am I just paying for it, and my money's gone down a rabbit hole, or did I pay for something and my and my money held? Mm-hmm. And a good example, and you saw me do this, is I began to buy old stuff. Right? right, Mary and I bought used cars forever because if I bought a new car, the second that I drove it off the lot, I lost money. It's, it's not, I can't sell it back to the dealership for what I just paid for. It. And no one's going to write me a check. I've just lost money. Mm-hmm. So Mary and I immediately, you know, we understood that. So everything we bought, we bought. And I, and I learned if you bought a collectible old car, it actually retained 100% of its value. So Mary's first car that we bought her was an old used Jaguar. Mm-hmm. And, and it was old. But it was but it was in great shape because they always kept these classic cars in great shape, right? But it was very affordable, cheaper than most, I mean, very inexpensive, by the way. Uh, and by the way, when I sold it years later, they gave me my money back. The and first time you that- taught me that lesson was we were sitting on the couch behind you in the place where you're recording. And that was some of the original furniture you bought for the first Keller Williams office, those red, that red couch, right? Yeah, yeah, right behind me on, on this call. The yeah, Joe, Joe and I. Um, the first piece of furniture we bought for the company was a thousand dollars, and we paid it for a uh, couch and two chairs. And yeah, by the way, I still have the, that's my <laughs> furniture. And when I die, you'll you will I promise you, you will sell them for the exact same money minimum that I pay for it. That's right. And that was the thing you told me. If I go to Office Depot and I buy some office chairs, in five or six years, they're in the junkyard. Yeah. I've lost 100% of the value that I've spent. So that's just that I that mentality of being an investor and learning that is that would that just made such an impression on me. But the value yeah, you have to you have to have a lot of money before you buy a new car. And particularly that car we talked about in episode 1, right? The if you're if you're driving a Mercedes or that expensive car, you do understand that if you paid 80, 120, whatever you paid for that car, the second you drive it off, it has gone down way in value. And three years later, that car has gone from 120 to 75, buddy. Right. You've lost money. Now, you better be making a lot of money to be able to, to, to choke that one down. But if you went and bought a used classic car, meaning that you went and bought the six-year-old, the nine-year-old, the whatever, right? That's a different thing. And, and I'll tell you, it's really interesting because Mary had a, a cancer scare and she'd always talked about her dream car was a convertible Jaguar. And we didn't have, we didn't have that. We had the old, we had an old, you know, uh, mm-hmm. J6 or whatever they called it. But so we could afford, I could afford to now buy something new and lose money. 
man, I still hate that decision. But we did. We went out, John and I, he was just a little kid. We picked it up. We bought it. We still own that car because I am not going to sell that car for a loss. <laughs> You're just going to hope that it becomes a classic. Jay, the truth of the matter is, yeah, that we lost so much money on that car. Hopefully, we had great experiences with it, but um, we still own that car. And I am not going to sell that car and 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 write down the loss on it, right? I'm, I just can't do it. Well, let's if, move it, on. if someone said that, right, let's go to myth number two. I think we're both going to the same place. If what if they say, I don't want or need to be financially wealthy, I'm happy with what I've got, Gary. I think that's the second myth, right? I don't need to be financially wealthy. I'm happy with what I've got. What's the problem with that? Yeah, well, the problem is you need to open your eyes. You, you do need and want to be financially wealthy. And the reason is because you really don't know what's coming. Mm-hmm. And my mom and dad were good examples of that. And that is, they had everything planned perfectly, and then nothing goes perfectly. And as a result of that, um, they didn't have enough money and uh, in order to actually live their life. And um, so, it, so dad sold his home and then he rented from my sister and I the rest of the, and so did my mom the rest of her life. And my experience has been that you don't know how much money you're going to need. And it's very, very um, uh, almost entitled, but definitely naive to believe that your plan as you think about it is going to be, an, it's going to be enough. Because all it's going to take is for, Someone in your family, as just as an example, that isn't that that did, did, didn't do as well, or didn't they didn't plan, and then they show up on your doorstep with a child, or they show up on your doorstep and they go, I, I you know, we need help, and you look up and you can't help them. And and look, I don't I don't say this judgingly, but I have two sisters, and one of them was never able to help, not at all. And and not a penny, by the way, not not couldn't help a dime. My parents were would have been stuck with with what they had, you know, and make it work. My little sister and I had earned money in excess, uh, and by the way, they were investors too, and and we were able to to help our parents out our entire life. And I'll tell you this, Jay, my mother, the week that she died, was sitting in a hospital bed. And we were just talking and she turned to me and she just said, you're a good son. Mm-hmm. She said, I could not have had the life that I've been living without, without you and your sister. So it was, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not dissing on my, my other sister because I love her and she's awesome and it, it's no fault of hers. I mean, she did exactly what she needed to do uh, for herself, but there was no extra. And by the way, there's always a need for extra. It could be for unforeseen challenges, but also opportunities, right? Maybe your kid gets into that special school and you want to be able to send them to whatever it is. So there's opportunities and challenges that you just can't anticipate. So, I mean, you said this since day one, you got to aim high, right? You've got to aim beyond your minimums so that you can know that you're there for those shocks and other things that happen later. You're going to reach a point in your life where there will be people you care about, loved ones, uh, friend, dear, 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 dear friends that financially need help, Jay. They will need it. And it's not your mission. You don't, it doesn't have to be your mission in order to be able to help them. In my case, it was. Right. I, I wanted to be able to do that. And so I set my, my aim a little higher um, and knew that I needed to be financially wealthy. Right. Well, the third myth is people will say, well, okay, fine. But it doesn't matter if I want it or need it. I just can't do it. And here's oh. what I tell them. Oh, yeah. I tell Those them. Those words, can't. I can't, I can't. I just, it sticks in my craw, Gary. Yeah. Well, I, what I tell them is, look, here's the truth. You can't predict what you can or can't do until you try. And my experience around money is uh, it's not complicated. It appears like this massive mountain to climb to try to understand money because it may be totally foreign to you. But it's so, it's so easy. It's so simple. It it once you understand it, you look up and you and you just see it everywhere. You all of a sudden you everything, whether you like it or not, you start thinking as everything of should I invest in that? Should I not invest in that? Why would I do this or not do that? It becomes very simple for you. But how old were you when you believed that you finally became financially literate, Gary? Roughly. Oh, it would have been. 
uh, in my late, would have been my late 20s. Yeah, for me, thanks to you, right? I joined and we did all the interviews for The Millionaire Investor. And I looked up and I was like, everything I thought I knew about money was not quite right. And it certainly wasn't about wealth. It might have been about how to get a better job and how to manage a 401k. It had nothing to do with building true wealth. And that was in my 30s. Mm-hmm. And I think I just want to say for most people, if you're listening to this and some of this, like, I don't, I'll never get it. It's not that complicated. I'm a French English major. If I can figure this stuff out, it's not that complicated. It is a journey. And the shame is we all should have been taught this stuff in high school. That is the biggest opportunity out there is that we all could have learned this younger so that we could have made different choices earlier in life. Yeah, but the reason why it wasn't taught is because the people that were teachers, God bless them, were not investors. Yeah. And, and they thought that their job in teaching retirement was their financial wealth. And because of that, not a one of them ever mentioned it. Not a one. Now, I, I went all the way through a four-year college degree, came out, and nobody ever talked about it. Right. And and I got I got blessed. You and I wrote about this in the millionaire real estate investor. But I had a friend who became a financial advisor and we reconnected after um, uh, a handful of years after college. And I started having breakfast with him and Uh. he slowly but surely taught me about money, challenged me, gave me books to read. And then we would talk about it. And he made me create my first financial statement, blah, 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 blah. And God bless him. I mean, he. He, he, I owe, I owe it to him. I mean, to be honest with you, I don't know what That's, I did to deserve his friendship, but he changed my life. And, and through you, the lives of innumerable others, Gary. And we interviewed, um, I don't know if you remember the coalition partners, those three gentlemen in Washington that started their business, but they were very clear their mission, right, was to create wealth in their community. And one of them articulated that when you teach a young person that's never been taught, about wealth and how it's made and how to invest, it could become a multi-generational gift. Now they'll raise their kids with that knowledge. And it's just, it's such an amazing thing. Well, the trick is in in order to, if if you're, um, if you have the ability and you can, and you can do with less for a period of time, you will be blessed to do with more the rest of your life. Yes. And what that means is, is that you're going to have to live beneath your means and you're going to live definitely beneath the means of what society might tell you that you need. For a period of time. Yeah, because you're going to, you're going to need to grab that money Mm -hmm. instead of, instead of that, right? You're, 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 you're going to have to, your vacations and your trips are going to have to be the free stuff or close to free. Right? Yes. And, on the front and, end, yeah, that's, you'll, that's, you'll make your coffee and put it in a to-go mug instead of paying $5 for it on the way to work. Just some little yeah, sacrifices or, up front multiply in terms of what you get down the, down the road. Yeah, the thing that you and I would tell anybody listening that doesn't own a home is your first home should be your first investment property. That's right. It, it should be. I know it turned into you for you and it turned in for me. Because I had the right coach. I didn't buy it like an investment. I got the lesson about two years later, but we turned it into an investment and it's still paying us income today. Yeah, the mistake that people make when they buy their first home is they they don't think of it as an investment. So they go out and they buy what they really want. And that's nothing wrong with that, but it has to meet the first criteria. And that is that it's a good investment, that it is the, in the right spot to appreciate and or give you cash flow. And when you do when you do that, you're on your way. Well, let's 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 switch gears. So those are the three personal myths that 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 I that I believe in. The the but then there's hey guys, why don't we stop there? Because uh, if we listen to it, we're going to run out of time. And uh, but if you turn to page seventy one in the MREI book, uh, there's kind of like the bullet points of what to remember from this chapter. Uh, I encourage you that that's that's from. Uh, Think what we were just listening to is Think Like a CEO podcast, uh, season number five. Season number five is the one that corresponds to this book. Uh, the first four seasons are totally separate things. Um, but these bullet points here, it talks about, uh, all right, so I'm here on page 71. Anyone want to take a crack at reading? Want to, anyone want to read one? Sure. Um, points to remember? Yep. 
Many high achieving investors have faced fears or doubts about investing that ultimately proved unfounded. These common misunderstandings can stand between you and true financial wealth building. Examining them can ultimately free you to push, pursue your dreams. Can you do one more? And then sure. we'll, 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 uh, everybody will do two and we'll, and we'll keep switching off. Yes, you do need to be an investor. Chances are your current job income and savings plan will not be nearly enough to build true financial wealth. Your job is your job. Building financial wealth is something else. Eric Bailey, you want to uh, read the next couple of points? Yeah. Yes, you do need and want to be financially wealthy. Becoming an investor is about preparing for the minimums and maximums in your life instead of forgetting your dreams and living within your means. Pursue the means to live your dreams. Yes, you can do it. Don't place limits on your financial potential. I can't, it's just a rationale for not trying. Believe that the true financial wealth is possible for you no matter where you are in your life. Perfect, uh, David B, uh, David Bowler, would you mind reading the next couple? You bet. No, investing doesn't need to be complicated. It's only as complicated as you make it. Learn the basics and build on them over time. Great investing can be learned if you take it slow, start with the basics and follow proven models. Yes, you must invest in what you know. Pick an area and become an expert over time. Real estate investing is one of the easiest areas in which to acquire this expert knowledge and understanding. Uh, uh, David Asimanfar, would you mind uh, reading the next couple? Uh, David, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Investment isn't about taking risk. It's about following sound investment principles and models, thereby taking the risk out of the game. Yes, timing is important, It's but it's active, not passive. Opportunities cannot be observed from the sidelines. You must be in the game. Timing isn't about being in the right place at the right time. It's about being in the right place at all the time. Wonderful, and I'll, I'll read the last couple. No, the good investments are not all taken. Opportunities are always there in every market and in every time. Yes, they will, all, they will all be taken by someone, but realize that that someone could be you. Step past short-term thinking. Small investments can have extraordinary implications over time, thanks to the power of compounding. There you go. Um, uh, any, any, we've got, we've got some, a few minutes here. Anybody, uh, things we've learned today, things in the future, things that you're excited to, to topics you want us to start going over. Uh, what are you looking forward to in this class? Anything, any comments open? Well, I was just looking at my next car purchase because my lease will be up. Um, soon, which was a mistake to get a lease, first of all. But um, I like what he said about classic cars because I like classic cars. So maybe my next car will be an investment and it'll be a classic car that won't depreciate. All right, Tracy, I, I, got a, I, I have a weird story around this. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll say, you guys know I used to have a lot of money and I made a lot of really, really, really stupid things. Surprisingly, one of the few stupid things that I, that one of the few things I did that everyone thought was stupid and was actually not very stupid at all was that when, when the, <laughs> this is just so weird. This is such a weird story. The, the, you guys remember when Lehman Brothers uh, went under and every, this was like right in 2008 when everyone was freaking out and everyone was all over the place. Well, it just so happens that someone I knew pointed me to someone they knew who pointed me to someone who knew who was getting, who was unloading, who had to unload in a hurry, a Porsche, a black Porsche 911, C2 cab, convertible, all black. It was just the most baller thing. And here's the weirdest part is that it was like six years old at the time, but someone had bought this thing in Las Vegas and they put it in some warehouse somewhere and they never touched it. It had, it had so few miles on it that it was, that, 
like a normal Porsche at that age had was like 30,000 miles or 50,000 miles. It had like 3,000 miles on it. And it was so few miles that, that it's, it actually decreases. It's, this is a weird thing, but it decreases the value when it has that few of miles on it. I don't know why, but there's a reason why. I, who cares? All I know is I figured out in my head, I had the cash, I'll buy this thing, I'll drive it for a year, and I can put as many goddamn miles as I want on it because there's it's it think it doesn't have enough miles on it. So I can literally drive it. And so I did. I bought, I bought this car. Everyone thought I was nuts. And you know, some people like buy a Porsche and they like drive it. No, I drove the shit out of this thing. I used to go up in the mountains like on Angeles Crest Highway. Oh, I, you know, I can tell you the limits of a Porsche 911. And it was it was everything I hoped it would be. And I sold it a year later and I didn't get quite what I paid for it. But I only lo I lost four thousand. I bought it for what sixty two, and I sold it for four thousand dollars less for fifty eight. Four thousand dollars to own a Porsche for a year and drive the living shit out of it. So, you know, you know, I'm I, I, I'm never going to probably buy a nine eleven again in my life. I'll buy, not not for a few years. Let's put it that way. But I will say that you know, so you never know how these things are going to work out. And I love like I love what Gary said. Just like do your homework. Like I. Before I did that, I triple checked all my numbers and everything because I was like, everyone's gonna think I'm a nut. But I, but I, I, I did everything. I like, I saw the insurance. I, I knew what I had. Surprisingly, that was not one of the dumb things I did. I did many, many other really dumb things, but that was not one of them. So weird story, I know. But uh, yeah, you buy a car used, and you know, as long certain cars are really expensive to maintain. Uh, but if you know what you're doing, like you can, you can you know, do well and, and with a, with a used car. I think the pandemic has taught us not to assume the future is something that we can estimate. That's a great point. I mean, you know, yeah, it's funny that, that when he's talking about, oh, you, you know, everybody who's, you know, pinching pennies and saving up because they think they have it all planned out like Gary's parents, right? They had it all planned out. The problem is that Rarely does anything go according to plan, right? And, you know, even if you save up and invest in all that, there's no guarantee, but you play the odds that you'll have more than you need. And you can, it's, it's really easy to downsize in a pinch when you need to, like, and, and live off of less if you need to. It's a really hard to come up with money if you're faced with some expenses and you don't have enough to cover it, right? A question is, obviously you wanna have a better life by really working hard and accumulating wealth. Uh, how do you, where do you draw the line of really increasing your, your, uh, your lifestyle? I mean, how do you, when do you know that you need to do that? That's a, that's a question that I've been asking myself. You know, okay, you have this much money and all that, but what are you gonna do with it? What is it that you, uh, you know, when do you wanna spend this money? What do you wanna do with it? Yeah. Where do you draw the line? That's a question. That, that's the million dollar question right there, quite literally, right? That, that is the million dollar question, right? Is, yeah, yeah. Ask Jeff Bezos. And, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I mean, let's not go to the extreme. I, I do have uh, quite a few friends that have, you know, that they're like multimillionaires. But from my point of view, they don't have, they don't enjoy what they have. That's again my point of view. It may be different from their point of view. Okay, yeah. that's you know, so maybe I'm judging them for what they you know, how they spend their money. But uh, is it valid to judge the people like that that they don't spend their money at all? They don't just they just keep accumulating for no reason. Yeah, I mean that, that's a that's a personal philosophical question. I, you know, I'd say anybody anybody else want to take a crack at that. Yeah, I just don't know. I'll tell you, you know, my own thinking is that I want my wife and I to come up with like, what, like, let's figure out what is our freedom number to live at a, not necessarily like, you know, not that we need to stop at that number, but what, what is a comfortable number that if we had that number, we'd be set the rest of our lives and living, like living comfortable, you know, for me, that's like having a house, having cars that are paid for and being able to vacation a few times a year like not, doesn't even have to be like huge crazy stuff but just quality of life you know being able to put our kids through school 
uh, you know, having, and not having to worry about finances as much. And then what I'm thinking is like, I'm going to make as, you know, invest and keep making as much money as I can and have that goal. You know, the way that's in my head from all these things that we've been reading and in my thinking lately is that that's the number we hit. And if we make more than that, I don't want to just like start spending every penny of it, but you know, accumulate more. And then at some point, if we're like, Hey, you know what? We can afford more money. You know, we can, we can afford more now. Maybe then we, we, we take the luxury, but just knowing that we don't need that. We can always, you know, I feel like I'm old enough in life where I don't, I don't, there there was a time when I, I, I thought I needed a whole lot more than I now. Well, doesn't your freedom number include all of those things that you want and need to have in your life? So it includes the vacations and all of those, what we would call luxury things in addition to the necessities, right? So, I mean, like I kind of had that planned out this year for myself. I'm like, I'm going to take this many vacations. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to pay these things. And, and I've been fortunate enough to hit those marks and now I'm going to, you know, set a new plan, but it's like, if you have that freedom number, then you kind of know these things that you want to accomplish and the luxury items. And then maybe you can start filling in with some more charitable giving or some giving back or, you know, some other things like that. You know, that's how I think of it. Yeah. And yeah. And, and on that note, Tracy, you're, you're right. And, and maybe there's, maybe there's more than one number you're looking for. Maybe there's the one of like, Hey, here's the baseline. Like if I needed to, I could, I could coast right now and I would be fine, but that's not really where I want to be at. Like, I really want to be a little, you know, further ahead of that. So I can, I, I can take some more, you know, some more luxury vacations and stuff. Maybe not quite, you know, it doesn't have to be huge, but whatever that number is for you. And maybe some people are like, I want, you know, I want, I want it all. I want to, you know, I want to live up in the hills and, and, you know, have that hundred, you know, 20,000 square foot house and all that kind of whatever. There's no wrong, right or wrong. I just know for me, I just I, like, I don't know. That, that doesn't even attract me all that much anymore. That, that kind of, that kind of wealth. Um, well, I'm, I'm no expert, but I think a wild card issue that we have to be realistic about is the metal, medical debt is consuming America. I heard somebody say a half of all personal debt is medical bills. And I'm like, really? While we were sitting here, I just Googled real quick and it says 18% of Americans are in collections for medical. It's like, whoa. So I would say the freedom number needs to be uh, real. And then we, I don't know how it works, but we need to add 25% or something else for medical stuff. Yeah. Because you know, all it takes is somebody to T bone you on, you know, a drunk driver on a stoplight and we got all kinds of problems now. Not to be negative, but. That's no, no, the they, truth, though. That's a yeah. that's a fact. That if my credit report is full of medical debt, uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I've run in. I, I've gotten myself into trouble two times in my life. The first time was sheer youth stupidity of wanting to live like a rock star uh, on a you know on a on a modest. I mean, I, I made good money, but it, I wanted to live like you know freaking like a rock star, like le- legit. Uh, and then the second time I was, the second time I was actually starting to get my life together and, and I, I was accumulating real estate properties and all that kind of stuff. And, and I got slammed with a couple of unexpected things that were out of my control. Granted, I should have planned for them better. I was underinsured. Uh, but you know, that's what took, medical debt is a good part of what took me down a huge, it was most of what, most of what the trouble I ran into. Anybody else want to comment on that? Well, yeah, you know, it, you know, I, I came from an insurance industry uh, and for 22 years, I was an insurance advisor. And, um, you know, we really need to understand what the risks are and ensure for those things, item, those items or those events that actually could put you in a really bad financial situation. Uh, I, you know, I, I mean, long stories, you know, I, I hear people, you know, I was offering people term life insurance for $15 a month for let's say $100,000 or $200,000. They say no to that, but they spend $15 a month insuring their $500 fall. That was really funny to me. That was, okay, now you, you know, it just doesn't make sense. Economically, it just doesn't make sense. You're insuring your $500 fall for, for $15 a month, but you don't want to insure 
your family's future for $15 a month. So you really understanding the risk, what the risk is all about and what you actually uh, can come across yeah. and make, making sure to your best, you can't possibly see every corner. You have to really do your best as much as you can to minimize the risk. Yeah, that, that's a great point, David. And we'll wrap up there because it's four o'clock. Um, for next week, let's keep reading. The, the next section of the book is uh, think like a, think a million, uh, starting on page 75. That's what we'll read for, for next week. Um, on that note of insurance, at some point we're going to cover insurance. It's at some point, sometime we'll, we'll cover insurance and maybe I'll, I'll see if we can get, if, if one of you guys has a great insurance agent who you think would be good to present, I have a financial planner who I think would be pretty good. Uh, but we, it would be great to have someone here to kind of cover like, Hey, living in LA, this is the, you know, in our business, here's the kind of insurance you should be looking at. Well, I, I was going to ask uh, David that uh, because obviously he's had some experience in terms of at least uh, life insurance, maybe mm -hmm. your recommendations. And I don't know if we're out of time now, but something that like, what are the basics uh, that that you would co consider carrying? Yeah, actually, you know, I you know I was doing all of the insurance lines, uh, uh, personal line, auto home and all that. So uh, you know, and I sold my agency two years ago. So but I do have knowledge, uh, basic knowledge, and in, in more than basic into insurance. Yeah. So if you if you need my help, I'll be happy to help you. Just put a light on it, you know. Just making making sure you that your concerns are you know addressed. Perfect. So, so you know, I, I, it's the, the topic is going to come up several times. It's going to come up and think like uh, in in the real estate investor as we go through this book. It's going to come up when we do the the think win make give podcast it's going to come up there and either way we're going to we're, 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 we'll plug at some point we're going to go insurance and, and david I'll, I'll uh i'll be sure to reach out to you to see if uh if you want to help present that day uh, sure. as, as somebody who has you know expertise in that that area um well this is really cool guys i i know we're, we're working a lot on mindset for these first few weeks I, I i promise we'll get to the good stuff and start calculating investments and all that kind of stuff but I promise, I don't know for you, but I can already tell, like for me, my mindset's shifting and it's, it, this is awesome stuff. So I hope you guys can make it next week at uh, Thursday at, at three and uh, we'll see you next week. Oh, by the way, before you guys go, one last thing, shoot me a text or an email and remind, and so I have all your contact information. You've got mine in the chat bar, but uh, that way I can make sure I'm going to create a Facebook group today uh, for our little budding investor group. And we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. All right, guys. See you next Thanks, week. Ed. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Most welcome. Love you guys. See ya.